Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Este, hoy tenemos un seminario especial, un día corrido, por el feriado de mañana. Este, hoy tenemos el placer de presentar este, a Satoru Emori, que viene de Virginia Tech, de Estados Unidos, ¿sí? y nos va a hablar sobre Pumping Iron, Revealing Counterintuitive Mechanism of Magnetization Dynamics. Les voy a contar un poquito sobre Satoru. Bueno, les cuento que Saturo es el profesor asociado en el Departamento de Física de Virginia Tech. ¿Sí? Él hizo su bachelor en ciencias este, de la Universidad de California y su doctorado en el MIT. Luego hizo dos este, estancias postdoctorales, una en la Universidad del Noreste y otra en Stanford. Y finalmente este, es profesor en Virginia Tech desde 2017. Sí, este, su investigación está focalizada este, en la dinámica de, magnet, de magnetización, ¿sí? en películas delgadas y este, su potencial para este, usarse en memorias de, y computadoras. Él recibió eh, un, un premio ¿sí? de la National Science Foundation en 2022 y este, fue elegido referí Outstanding de la APS, me salía Outstanding, que es, bueno, no importa, sobresaliente, ahí está, de la APS. Este, y ahora, él viene como parte del programa IEEE ¿sí? de este Lecturer Distinguished, o Distinguished Lecturer, que básicamente van recorriendo el mundo, ¿sí? contando una, este, una presentación que fue elegida, bueno, por la IEEE para, para ser contada, ¿no? Este, así que, bueno, Saturu, thank you very much for coming here, and then please start your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias por la linda introducción. <laughs> uh, uh, yo estudié uh, español uh, en la uh, escuela secundaria <laughs> hace muchos años. Uh, por eso pienso que uh, su inglés es mucho mejor que mi español. So yeah, I will, I will then just carry the rest of this out in English, if that's OK. OK. All right, so I would like to say a, a little bit about the IEEE Magnetic Society. Uh, so perhaps quite a few of you folks here are familiar with this already. But uh, actually, could you raise your hand if you are a student? Uh, estudiantes? OK. Uh, muy bien. Um, so what I want to say, without spending too much time here, is especially if you're a student working on any area of magnetism, uh, I would recommend signing up to be a member of the society. Uh, in particular, what, I, you know, what I'm most impressed <clears throat> about what the society does, among many other things, uh, is this annual magnetic summer school. This happens every single year uh, on a different continent. Uh, in fact, this summer, um, I, 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 I was actually able to attend this for the first time ever. As a student, I, was, um, I actually never attended. I wish I did. But in any case, yeah, this magnetic summer school this year uh, was in uh, Taiwan, Taipei, Taiwan. And it was a great deal of fun. Uh, I was having fun even though I was not a graduate student. And I could tell that uh, you know, all the graduate student attendees who came from all over the world Um, I believe even, I'm trying to remember, perhaps even a few from South America as well. Uh, in any case, yeah, this is a great networking opportunity for you all. Um, you get to hear many interesting, excellent talks from different areas of magnetism. Um, and aside from all the, you know, the technical meetings, so picking up, you know, interesting technical things, uh, there's also a lot of informal networking as well. You get to have dinner. Uh, go out to have drinks with many, many people. Um, in any case, yeah, great place to get to know people. Oh, I forgot to tell you the best part of it. Uh, it's free. So you do not have to pay anything. You don't have to pay for your own travel expenses, lodging expenses. Everything is paid for by the Magnetic Society. Uh, so this is also, of course, good news for your uh, thesis advisor. So good all around. Okay, so yes, please think about it. Um, yeah, so uh, a few of you folks are actually asking me already uh, about Virginia Tech, what it's like over there. So I'll give you a quick answer to that question right now. 
so this, as you can see, is the map of the uh, continental United States. Um, so we are located arguably in the eastern part of it. We are about, I would say, 400 kilometers, 400 kilometers away from Washington, D.C. Um, so we're not really close to any of the nice beaches, but uh, we are, in fact, surrounded by a lot of mountains, a lot of nature around there, lots of greens. Okay, so here are some nice pictures taken around the area. Uh, we have hiking trails with great views. Uh, caves with very interesting interiors, beautiful waterfalls. Uh, there are even some places, uh, breweries and wineries that make their own beers and wines in the middle of beautiful farms. Uh, and this here is a picture of our uh, small college town. So the, the town of Blacksburg has a population of about 50,000. Okay, and I want to just very quickly acknowledge my research group. Um, so these are some pictures of both the current and past members. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to acknowledge uh, specifically uh, Berus Kuradadi, uh, who is our former postdoc, uh, who really spearheaded the, the study that I'm about to show you today. Okay. Um, and not just the study, but you know, uh, many of the studies that we have done in our research lab are in fact very collaborative, spanning uh, multiple institutions. But again, in the interest of time, um, <clears throat> I'm going to give um, special acknowledgement to this team, the group, uh, the group at the University of Alabama, headed by professors Tim and Claudia Mavis. Uh, so what you'll notice about my talk today is that you will see a lot of data, a lot of results from magnetic resonance measurements, fMR measurements. Now, in my lab at Virginia Tech, we carry out our own fMR measurements, uh, but it turns out for this particular study, uh, we really leveraged, we really took advantage of some of the specialized fMR measurement capabilities in, um, <clears throat> in the group of uh, doctors Mavis. Uh, so, in fact, all the FMR measurements that you're going to see today uh, were acquired at the University of Alabama rather than at Virginia Tech. All right, so let's get on with things. Uh, so some of you might have seen the title uh, in the advertisement. Right? The title of this talk has something to do with pumping iron. I just want to clarify, first of all, that this talk has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the former governor of California. Okay. But of course, what we'll be talking about here uh, is, you know, it's all about exciting magnetization dynamics, magnetization in ferromagnetic materials like iron, okay? And we can do this with a variety of different ways. Microwave magnetic fields, electric current pulses, uh, light pulses, uh, temperature pulses, you name it. There are many, many ways to do it. But more broadly speaking, um, here's a quick video, video representation of the dynamics that we are interested in. So we have this red arrow, the magnetization, processing or rotating about some effective magnetic field. Right. So not only is it processing, it's actually relaxing, so it's actually converging toward the direction of this blue effective field. So it's really this relaxation or converging process, the damping process that we are interested in here. So there are many, many mechanisms that can give rise to the effective relaxation of magnetism, uh, but here we are actually going to focus on what is called Gilbert damping. Great. All right, so here's a quick roadmap, the outline of what I'll be talking about for the next uh, maybe 45 minutes or so. Um, but you know, again, feel free to ask me any questions um, if something's unclear, or if you have a burning question, yeah, please try to grab my answer or just shout out your question. Okay, uh, so I understand that, you know, even though many of you folks might be working on some aspects of magnetism or microwaves and stuff like that, um, I think it's still a fairly diverse audience. So I wanted to start out with some of the basics, why we care about this so-called Gilbert damping and how we actually measure it. Uh, and then, of course, I will spend uh, a fair amount of time uh, explaining, uh, explaining our study. So starting with the material that we have selected to study, as well as the magnetic resonance results. Uh, and finally, I'll point out that you know, there, there is actually going to be a, a somewhat surprising or perhaps counterintuitive finding 
So towards the end, I'll actually attempt to explain how to make sense out of that counterintuitive or surprising finding. All right, so let's get on with the basics first. All right, so here's an even simpler picture of the dynamics that we are interested in, where the magnetization uh, is tilted away at some non-zero angle from the effective magnetic field. So in an ideal case, when you don't have any damping, the magnetization would just persist forever and ever about the effective field axis. And mathematically, this is captured by this simple torque equation, so magnetization crossed by the magnetic field. So that gives us the time evolution of the magnetization. So it's, you're going to get perpetual precession. Now, more roughly speaking, this is quite a bit analogous to the precession of a spinning toy top about the vertical axis. But now, just like any processing toy top eventually falls down because, well, there's friction, um, there's also an equivalent, uh, equivalence of friction in magnetic materials as well. Uh, instead of the magnetization falling down, what it does is actually the opposite of the processing top. Uh, it actually converges, it, uh, it relaxes towards that magnetic field axis. So this sort of damping process is present in all real magnetic materials, all real magnetic materials. And this typically happens on a, a relatively short time scale. So we are talking about maybe picoseconds up to maybe a few nanoseconds or so. So very fast compared to our everyday time scale. Now, if you think about it though, um, it's actually thanks to damping that we can magnetize a magnetic material. Because if there is no, if there is no damping, the magnetization was, would just continue to process about the field. You would never be able to align the magnetization along the direction of the field that you are applying. So it's all thanks to, to damping that we can actually magnetize something or anything. Now, the mathematical description, again, you know, it's all captured by a torque equation, uh, but now we have two terms. So we have, on one hand, the processional torque, and we have an extra term capturing this damping process. Uh, this is what's called the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. Uh, so for those of you who in magnetism, uh, you have probably seen this at some point or many, many times. Now, throughout this presentation, especially towards the end, uh, you will be seeing this Greek letter alpha uh, quite frequently. So in fact, this is the key parameter, the key number, key parameter that we will focus on. So that's what's called the Gilbert damping parameter. It's a number that parameterizes, that quantifies the strength of Gilbert damping. Okay. Now let me say a little bit about why we should care about Gilbert damping, aside from the general fact that it's present in every single magnetic material. So it actually matters for some device applications. So it turns out there, there are quite a few device applications out there for which we wish to minimize the amount of damping because damping, again, is somewhat like friction. It's a, it's a dissipative process. So through damping, you tend to lose a fair amount of, uh, a fair amount of energy. Therefore, it stands to reason that by lowering damping, you can then develop more energy efficient information and signal processing devices. So I'll give you a couple, couple of examples very quickly. So one of them is just a simple digital magnetic memory device where you are storing the digital information in the form of magnetization direction, right? Up is one, down is zero. Now, in order to have a working memory though, you want to be able to switch between these two states back and forth in a controllable manner. Now, the way in which the magnetization uh, uh, switches, it actually does not take a direct path. It, it actually takes somewhat, uh, sort of a long pathway, sort of a spiraling pathway from one direction to the other. Now, if we have a low damping material, we can then induce, we can start this kind of spiraling dynamics with a lower amount of power input. So in other words, by achieving low damping, we can have a magnetic memory that operates with better energy efficiency. Okay, so low damping gets us better energy efficiency. However, there is sort of a trade-off. So by lowering damping, you actually end up slowing down the switching process. 
In other words, if you have high damping, you can get the magnetization to switch from one direction uh, and then converging towards the other direction within a much shorter time scale. So this is sort of a decision that you have to make uh, if you are trying to make a, a digital memory device. Do you want better energy efficiency or faster speed? So this, there is a trade-off. On the other hand, there are also other types of devices where there's really no trade-off. You just really want to minimize damping as much as possible. So these are devices where you would be using uh, spin waves, or some of you may uh, recognize that term as magnons, right? So it's sort of a rippling wave-like dynamics of magnetization in a magnetic material. By having low damping, first of all, you can start, you can initiate a spin wave with a, a lower amount of energy input. And furthermore, with lower damping, the spin wave can then propagate over longer distances with, well, with lower decay, lower dissipation. So here, low damping is absolutely good, good all the way around. Okay, so this is all I'm going to say about why we, are, why we care about damping from the applied perspective. But again, I would like to point out that this is a universal phenomenon uh, present in every single magnetic material. With that said, though, the actual basic fundamental mechanisms of damping are not all that well understood, even in some of the very seemingly simple magnetic materials. So in the ensuing uh, few minutes, I'll, you know, I hope to illustrate what I mean by that. Oh, actually, okay, so there's another thing that I have to say about the basics of damping, how we actually go about measuring it. Uh, again, this is probably some, uh, this is probably a technique that many of you, or some of you are familiar with, ferromagnetic resonance or FMR. Uh, but the basic idea is we excite our magnetic sample with an applied microwave field oscillating at, let's say, a frequency of a few gigahertz. So this is a, uh, a type of force oscillator or force oscillation setup. And in fact, actually another, uh, I would say a better way to envision how FMR works is that, well, it's a, excuse me, it's a type of absorption spectroscopy in the sense that you are monitoring how much of the incident microwave is being absorbed or transmitted by the sample. So in other words, I'm not sure why I have another cursor there. It's a little annoying. <laughs> Well, okay, I'll just do it that way. <laughs> uh, let's see. So whenever the, mag whenever the magnetic material reaches resonance, in other words, it's processing, the magnetization is processing at its maximum cone angle, it's absorbing the maximum amount of the, uh, the incident microwave power. So by keeping track of how much of the microwave field, or sorry, microwave energy is being absorbed, you see this peak, this actually corresponds to the resonance condition. So the magnetization has a sort of a favorite frequency, combination of favorite frequency and an externally applied magnetic field uh, at which it wants to process. So that's resonance. But we are here talking about damping, some kind of friction-like dissipation process. So just like any system that has resonance, right, a mechanical oscillator, uh, an RLC circuit and so forth, um, we can capture the amount of resistance or damping through the width of the resonance response. So if you have a material with low damping, you expect to see a very sharp peak with uh, a small line width. And on the other hand, if you have a material with very high damping, you would expect to see a much broader, much more smeared out resonance response. So that's the basic idea, that the line width is related, at least in the simplest cases, to the amount of damping in the material. All right, um, so we can do this kind of experiment not just at one fixed frequency, but at multiple different frequencies. So in materials that behave very nicely, you would often see this kind of linear response, so the line width changing linearly as a function of frequency. Uh, in general, you can see much, much more complicated responses, but in this presentation, I'm actually going to ignore all of those. So this is, this is sort of the first order simple picture. So in such a case, you can uh, quantify the so-called damping parameter alpha from the slope 
because it's proportional to the slope of flying width as a function of frequency. Okay, so now I can give you some actual numbers. Right, so uh, some of you might know permaloid. This is an alloy of nickel and iron, very magnetically soft, commonly used in magnetics research. These permaloid films tend to have a damping parameter of about 0.07, but of course, there are many, many other kinds of magnetic metals out there. Uh, you can have a pretty wide variety of different numbers spanning you know, at least two orders of magnitude from 0.001 to 0.1 or so. That's right. So, so in principle, the, the more internal information is in the magnetic field, not in the frequency. Right. Um, proportionality is with the magnetic field, not with the frequency. Let's see. Um, um, so at least to me, it's more straightforward to view line width being proportional to frequency because um, so something I haven't mentioned is you know just like mechanical friction, you know friction in the simplest sense. Magnetic damping here, or Gilbert damping here, is a viscous process. In other words, uh, you would actually start to see, you, you know, so this is a process where you would see more dissipation the faster the dynamics, right? So this is, so that's why it's, my understanding is that, yeah, that's why we would naturally see line width scaling linearly with a frequency. Um, now, in certain cases, there is a linear relationship between the resonance frequency and the magnetic field, uh, especially true if you have, let's say, you know, uh, a rather simple spherical sample, or in the case of a thin film, if you have the magnetization out of plane, um, there's... Yeah, we can do that too. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, so in this case, yeah, some people actually do carry out the experiments that way. So fixing the magnetic field and sweeping the frequency. And yes, of course, you would see a non-zero finite line width. The um, the relationship, though. So if you were to plot line width as a function of magnetic field from such experiments, um, the mathematical relationship through which you can get the damping parameter is actually more, it's a little bit more complicated. It's not a linear relationship anymore, but you can do it that way also. Yeah, does that sort of answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So I gave you some of the motivation, uh, how to measure, how to measure damping and so on and so forth. Um, now I would like to talk about, you know, I would now like us to talk a little bit about the physics. So where does damping come from? So that's actually a very complicated question because, well, the magnetic degree of freedom in a solid state system is connected to, well, a whole variety of other degrees of freedom, electronic, lattice, and, you know, and so on, so, well, electronic, lattice, and so on and so forth. But um, we can develop at least some kind of simple expectation. So again, drawing this analogy between magnetic damping and mechanical friction, well, Imagine if you have a, a material with, let's say, very rough, messed up surface, you tend to have a higher friction. And on the other hand, if you have a nice, smooth surface, you tend to have lower friction. So we might expect something similar out of this magnetic damping as well. So you might say that, well, we should get lower damping if you have a nice, clean material with less disorder and not a whole lot of electronic scattering. And this kind of simple intuition does seem to make sense in light of, again, the simple physical picture. So when the magnetization is processing, uh, what you're actually doing is you're generating artificially a transverse magnetic component, transverse magnetization component, uh, which at the end of the day, at the end of the day, consists of uh, a bunch of electrons with a particular spin polarization. Now, if there's quite a bit of electron scattering in the material, there's also a greater chance that the spin polarization would also be scattered, would be randomized. 
So you would expect that in the presence of a lot of scattering, you would also have spin scattering, which then results in a smaller amount of transverse magnetization component. So you would end up with a higher amount of damping. Okay. So this picture is, I think, something that a lot of us in the field would intuitively expect. But of course, it would be very nice if we could somehow Okay, so somehow this cursor is shifting. I'm just going to switch back to the laser pointer again. What's that? There's an additional button. Oh, this one. So if I do that, oh, okay, now it's frozen, so that's perfect. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, so the idea is we want to somehow verify or refute or test this mechanism experimentally. All right, so finally we get to talk about our experiments. But let's see, before we proceed though, any, any questions before we move on? Uh, yeah, you can, you, you can think of it that way too. So yeah, on one hand, you have some amount of dipolar field, although that tends to be kind of a small effect. But um, another thing that could happen is, well, if you have spins that are scattered or kind of in a randomized direction, well, no, okay, so that, that's way too complicated. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Sorry, your question is, okay, so when we have spin polarization, we have some kind of additional effective field acting on the magnetization itself. Yeah, so, yeah, so maybe why, why does this scattering of electrons translate to the damping of the magnetism? Ah, okay, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's Right, uh, so the, some, some of the effect back, as in, well, okay. So I think maybe what you're asking is, the, the amount of angular momentum changes from here to here. Where does it go? So I think my short answer is that it goes to the lattice, right? Because it's a dissipative process. And what we mean by dissipation in a solid state system is that the energy or maybe angular momentum is being lost into the lattice. Yeah. All right. Good. OK, so let's check out our experimental results at this point. Um, so we have tried to keep our experiment very simple. So we've only decided, we've decided to look exclusively at highly crystalline epitaxial thin films of iron. And what we mean by epitaxial is that, well, we grow our thin film on top of a crystalline substrate with a similar lattice structure, effective lattice parameter, as the film that we would like, right? And BCC body center cubic, of course, is the preferred crystal structure uh, of ferromagnetic solid iron. And okay, so why is this, why do we think this is a nice system? Well, first of all, well, it's simple in the sense that there's only one chemical element, it's just iron, nothing else. So in that sense, we shouldn't worry, we shouldn't have to worry about any kind of complications from, let's say, uh, some kind of chemical inhomogeneity, right? And second, this is quite convenient because just so happens that we have substrates that we can buy relatively cheaply, so not too expensive, that also happen to match with the lattice structure of BCC iron. And finally, uh, by having a nice crystalline epitaxial film, we are then able to compare our experimental results in a more straightforward manner with theoretical and computational predictions. Okay, so let me say a little bit about how we make these epitaxial iron films. Uh, we use a standard technique of magnetron sputtering, right? So simply coming from bombardment of accelerated argon plasma onto a chunk of iron in our case. We get a plume of iron. We end up with a thin film on the substrate. Now to promote crystallization, promote the growth of epitaxial thin films, we hold the substrate temperature at a, uh, a somewhat elevated value of 200 degrees Celsius. So this is to allow for all these atoms to, to find their thermodynamically preferred positions, the BCC crystal structure. 
So in this presentation, I'm going to focus on just one thickness of iron, 25 nanometers. Uh, turns out this is, actually, this is a very good thickness in the sense that it's not so thin that we have to worry about, let's say, some complicated things happening at the interfaces. So we're talking here about maybe almost, almost 100 atomic layers of iron. And also, this is not too thick. It's not so thick that we have to worry about complications arising from, let's say, inhomogeneous excitement along the magnetic, uh, the magnetic film thickness and so forth. But yes, we have looked at other thicknesses. And finally, of course, we have to protect the iron from spontaneous oxidation. So we have a capping layer of titanium. Okay. Now, you might have noticed that we have two types of crystal substrates. Um, and you might be wondering why. Here's the answer. This one substrate, what we call MAO, so short for magnesium aluminum oxide, this is a type of spinel oxide. Uh, this material actually has a nice, a nice degree of lattice matching with BCC iron, such that the resulting film is nicely coherently strained. So it actually tends to have uh, rather few defects, very few defects, good crystallinity. Now, on the other hand, when we grow iron on top of magnesium oxide, we have a much larger degree of lattice mismatch, such that although the, the iron film here is crystalline, it actually tends to contain quite a few defects. Uh, so this turns out to be a relaxed epitaxial film. And we can, of course, uh, directly compare the crystalline qualities of these two types of samples through X-ray diffraction. Okay, so here, uh, what we see is quite promising. We only see a diffraction peak from the substrate and from the film itself, uh, no other phases. So it's a nice single, appears to be a nice single phase crystalline sample. But we can say a little bit more by comparing the diffraction, diffraction peak corresponding to the film plane. So one thing you immediately notice is that uh, the sample on iron on MAO uh, has a much taller and sharper diffraction peak. And moreover, we also see these, this series of oscillation peaks, what we call thickness fringes. Uh, so these thickness fringes are what often get uh, film growth people very, very excited. So this is actually a nice indication that we have very flat and smooth surfaces, both on top and the bottom of the film. So these fringes arises because we have uh, parallel X-ray beams reflecting off coherently from the top and bottom. So in fact, what you are seeing here is a series of destructive and constructive interferences from the top and bottom of the, the iron film. Okay, so all this is to say that, yes, this already suggests that iron and MAO gives us a much better amount of, uh, much, uh, much better crystalline quality. We can also take a look at our uh, XRD rocking curve measurement. So without going into a whole lot of gory detail here, we again see a much taller and sharper peak for iron on MAO. What this indicates is that the different crystalline pieces, different crystallites within the film are much, much better oriented along the same direction within iron on MAO. Okay. Great. So right here we have two kinds of epitaxial films. So again, I emphasize that they are both crystalline, but one, one of them has a much, much better crystalline quality than the other. So at this point, you might then simply hypothesize that with this better crystalline quality in iron and MAO, we expect to see lower damping. But of course the question is, well, is it actually true? So that's what I'm going to show you next. But before we go on, um, I'm okay to stop you and accept any questions at this point, if there are any. Okay, so I think everybody wants to see what are going to be, what sort of results we're gonna see. Okay, so I'll show you first of all what we observed at room temperature. Okay, so using this fMR technique, measuring the fMR line width as a function frequency and paying attention to the slope. Slope as a measure of the Gilbert damping parameter. So quite surprisingly, what we saw is that there's actually no difference. Um, so they have, uh, they have essentially the exact same damping parameter of about 0.023. Uh, 
So this is quite surprising. Uh, so this is showing us, this is indicating to us that irrespective of the crystalline disorder, we are ending up with the same amount of Gilbert damping. Quite odd. Now, having said that, uh, there is sort of a, a small technical caveat. Um, so when we have, when we are measuring fMR with a sample magnetized within the plane of the film, it turns out that the line width that we're measuring here doesn't necessarily all come from Gilbert damping. There can be other kinds of magnetic relaxation. So for those of you folks uh, working uh, quite familiar with NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, you might be familiar with, let's say, the, the T1 type relaxation and T2 type relaxation. Gilbert damping here is analogous to T1, T1 relaxation. Whereas, well, there can also be other kinds of relaxation that are kind of like T2 type relaxation processes. Okay, so it's actually a very important legitimate question to sort of ask ourselves, uh, is what we're observing actually dominated by Gilbert damping? Now, fortunately, there is a nice workaround. Uh, it turns out, again, without going into a lot of gory explanations, when we have the film magnetized out of plane, we can suppress this pesky, annoying two magnon scattering process, T2, T2 like relaxation process. So, even here, what we observe is that the slope is indistinguishable, identical among all the, uh, the, the two samples and between these two measurement geometries. So, at this point, then, we can be quite confident that, in fact, what we are measuring here, the slope of line width versus frequency, um, is indeed dominated by Gilbert damping. Now, some of you in the audience might be wondering about the, uh, the difference, the notable difference in the vertical intercept. Uh, so, we can attribute that to the amount of magnetic inhomogeneity. Uh, so, there is a pretty well-established conventional wisdom in the field that the amount of vertical intercept is related to what we call inhomogeneous broadening, again, borrowing the language from NMR. Um, so the funny thing is that we tend to see more of the same homogeneous broadening, even though we are looking at the same material. Uh, but at this point, I'll just say that this, at least we believe that this is somehow related to the different kinds or different shapes of precessional orbit in the magnetic film. So in particular, without a plane, you have the magnetization precessing in more of a circular orbit, whereas within the plane, the orbit is nowhere near circular. It's actually a very squished elliptical orbit. Uh, so somehow, so I don't really have a rigorous explanation for this, but this is, this is sort of the, the primary suspicion that we have. Anyway, okay. So we see that Gilbert damping is pretty much identical, or really identical, uh, among different measurement types, uh, samples, and so forth. But this is a what room temperature. What are we going to see now at lower temperatures? I'm sorry? Oh, in-plane variations, yeah. Um, I don't have the data here, but we also did do angular dependent measurements as well in-plane. Um, we do see some amount of variation in line width, but by about 10%, both in the line width and the Gilbert damping parameters. So there's not so much pronounced uh, in-plane anisotropy. Ah, right, okay, so in what I'm, so here I'm showing you both, but in the following, uh, we're going to show you in-plane, strictly. Uh, so this has more to do with our technical limitation and the technical capability. All right, so let's go down in temperature. So 100 Kelvin, uh, again, we see that these two samples have very similar, rather similar Gilbert damping parameters. But if you're paying attention to the number on the last slide, right, at room temperature, we had a damping parameter of about 0.002. At 100 Kelvin, it's about a factor of two larger. So it's a, maybe a little strange because by going lower in temperature, presumably we are reducing the amount of electron scattering. Okay, it gets stranger. So when we go lower, again, the damping parameters, both of them increase but actually more so for the cleaner sample of iron and MAO. 
And that trend continues down to our minimum temperature of 10 Kelvin. So the damping parameters decrease as we lower the temperature, and it does so even more for the cleaner sample of iron on MAO. So here's a quick summary. So again, lower temperature results in the increase of both damping parameters and quite a bit more for the clean sample of iron on MAO. So I've been saying this a lot, but uh, so the, the key point here is that what we are observing here is exactly the opposite of the naive hypothesis that we came up with. We expected the damping to actually decrease as we decrease the amount of scattering, right? So of course, the question is, why is this happening? Now, before we jump into sort of, you know, more complicated quantum mechanical explanations, uh, we first started to think about sort of a more trivial classical origin of this observation. So one thing that could be happening as the magnetization is processing within this conductive metallic film is that you can have a time varying change of magnetic flux through some arbitrarily drawn loop. Uh, then we can have an induced eddy currents. So we, we can have eddy currents induced in the material which can conceivably result in energy dissipation. Right, so power dissipation going as, let's say, current square times resistance. So it's plausible that as we reduce the temperature, well, the film is going to get more and more conductive. That's the definition of a metal. So that means we're going to get more and more eddy currents. Uh, so finally, then we might expect to see more dissipation occurring via the classical eddy currents. So we might have some kind of eddy current contribution to the Gilbert damping parameter. Okay, so this is something we can check experimentally. So we can experimentally, of course, characterize the temperature dependence of electrical conductivity, or of course, uh, sorry, resistivity, and then the conductivity. Um, sorry about that, I think I pushed the wrong button. Okay, so not, so not too surprisingly, because we have, a, we have a nice pure elemental metal film, the conductivity does increase quite a bit going from room temperature to, to 10 Kelvin by almost an order of magnitude. And you can also see that the conductivity is about 20% greater in the low temperature limit for the cleaner sample of iron and MAO. Also not surprising because, well, it's a cleaner film so we should have, let's say, you know, we should have a smaller amount of uh, a residual resistivity coming from the defects. Okay, so just looking at this, it seems conceivable that eddy current damping could account for the fact that we are getting higher damping from less scattering. But let's look at it even further. So um, it turns out there is a nice model established in the 1960s allowing us to calculate the actual amount of eddy current damping, uh, damping parameter from experimentally measured conductivity. This is what we get, the solid curves down here. So again, you can see that the eddy current damping is, it's not quite negligible, right? It's definitely there accounting for maybe up to 10, 20% of the total damping, but it's not nearly enough to account for the entire temperature dependence. So you can then, of course, subtract out the eddy current damping from the total damping, and we still end up with qualitatively the same experimental trend. Right, so the damping, the overall, I would say, the intrinsic damping continues to increase with decreasing temperature, even more so for the cleaner sample. Okay, so we're essentially back to where we were just a few minutes ago, still wondering uh, why we are seeing higher damping in the cleaner sample at lower temperatures. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up this talk by giving you a theoretical explanation which turns out to have existed since the 1970s. So this is a really old study. And these the theoretical studies reached a consensus that in magnetic metals, there are two types of intrinsic Gilbert damping. One is what we call resistivity-like damping, uh, which is exactly the type of damping that we would have expected. So spin scattering or electron scattering leading to spin scattering 
leading to more damping. Okay. So you can probably guess what the other damping, other type of damping is called. It's called conductivity like. That's exactly the type of damping that is quite mysterious, uh, where we get higher damping with less scattering. And of course, where does this come from? Uh, if the eddy current damping is not the explanation. Okay, so this is where a, a rather nice model, what's called a breathing Fermi surface model, uh, comes to our rescue. Going back to, let's say, your class, solid state physics 101, basic solid state physics, we have this Fermi surface which captures the highest energy states that are occupied by electrons, but the key word here is, is that equilibrium, right? Technically speaking, we are not at equilibrium. We are exciting the material. The magnetization is processing. So we are somewhat out of equilibrium. As the magnetization is processing, because there is some interaction, what we call spin-orbit coupling, between the spin magnetic degree of freedom and the electronic, or if you will, the orbital degree of freedom, uh, the Fermi surface itself actually changes. The shape of it becomes distorted. Okay, this is a very simple cartoon. This is not what the real Fermi surface of iron looks like. It looks more complicated. But as a, you know, for the sake of simplicity, uh, I'm just depicting it as a simple ellipse. In any case, as the Fermi surface distorts, you end up with some amount of electrons that are left behind above the Fermi surface. So you know, we're talking about this is a grossly exaggerated cartoon. This only happens for a very short amount of time, maybe tens of femtoseconds or so. But nevertheless, you have some electrons above the Fermi surface. And at the same time, of course, we have some states that are not occupied by electrons. So we have some holes below the Fermi surface. OK, so as the magnetization processes, we end up with an excess amount of non-equilibrium electron hole pairs. All right. Now, these electron hole pairs, they don't survive forever. They only survive again for a short amount of time until, let's say, an electron scatters and maybe annihilates, right? Recombines with a hole. So this happens on the order of uh, electron momentum scattering time, so the average time between scattering events experienced by electrons. OK. So this is things get a little strange. So the idea here is that the longer these electrons and holes can survive without scattering, they go farther and farther away from equilibrium. So that when they finally annihilate, when they finally recombine via some scattering event, they end up dissipating a larger amount of energy. So that's really the key logic behind the so-called breathing Fermi surface model or conductivity like damping. So when there's less frequent scattering, these electron and hole pairs get more and more out of equilibrium so that when they finally scatter, when they finally annihilate, you end up with a higher amount of energy dissipation or damping. Okay, so hopefully this picture made some amount of sense to you, but I have to be honest that it's also a little strange to me this breathing Fermi surface model. So a couple of years ago, I tried to come up with uh, a more intuitive, analogous explanation. OK, so something that we can relate to in our real life experience. So I'm going to set all these scattering events analogous to you know, different kinds of reminders that we get through emails and WhatsApp and text and stuff like that. Right? If you're a student, you get probably many of those from your thesis advisor, or if you are a thesis advisor, you get many of those from your students. So it goes both ways. In any case, damping, I would say, is something that's analogous to the ultimate amount of psychological stress that you feel. OK, so what's the relationship? That's the question. What's the relationship between the reminders and the stress that you feel? OK, resistivity like damping, more frequent the scattering, the higher the damping. This is exactly the case like where you have more stress because you have too many reminders. OK, so now I think some of you are seeing where this is going. Conductivity like damping, again, with less scattering, you get higher damping. So I would, I would argue that this is a lot like these electrons procrastinating above the Fermi energy. They're just refusing to do the right thing in a timely manner. 
right? So the right thing for them to do is just relax back down below the Fermi energy, but they don't do that. Okay, so conductivity like damping is a case where you get more stress because you have not had any, you know, you have not had sufficient reminders. So you procrastinate it. You put off your work until the last minute. Okay. So hopefully this makes a little more sense now, but we can go back to the serious science. Uh, so there is a general theoretical framework that says, oh, yeah. Yeah. But it should be going super fast, like oh, uh, it's actually the other way around. So the magnetization is processing much more slow. So the time scale for magnetic resonance, we're talking about maybe a few tens of gigahertz. So maybe up to nanoseconds, 100 picoseconds or something like that. That's much, much longer than the electron relaxation time. Right, so elect... Mm -hmm. So, okay, this is a, a grossly exaggerated picture. Uh, so they only remain there for a very relatively short amount of time compared to the magnetization dynamics. But, you know, it is actually, it is happening continuously as well, right? So at every phase of the magnetic magnetization dynamics, the system is somewhat out of equilibrium. So it's a continuous process. But I, I agree with you that because there is such a, we're talking about a few orders of magnitude difference in time scale. Uh, it's, yeah, so that, that's also another thing that makes it harder for me to imagine how this is actually happening. But that is, th this appears to be the best explanation that we have at this point. And then, yeah, they're, they're always... Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's... That's right. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's grossly it's grossly exaggerated. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I like that explanation. <laughs> okay, I've never had that explained to me. Just, I, I like that explanation. I'm going to borrow that from you. <laughs> okay, yeah, but I, I, do, I do concede it's remarkable that this model can explain it, just giving the sheer difference in orders of magnitude uh, time scale. Anyway, um, where was I? Okay, so there could, so in general though, there could be both of these happening at the same time, right? And in fact, uh, with advances in computational material science, people now do have the ability to compute, theoretically calculate the expected damping parameter just given the realistic band structure of the material. Really all they need to know, mostly what they need to know is the amount of states, electronic states available near the Fermi energy, right? The Fermi surface. So people have done this over and over uh, since about 20, well, 15 years ago or so. Uh, so even though there were some, the, all these calculation results available, to our surprise, uh, we actually found that there had been no experiment, at least for pure iron, confirming these theoretical predictions. All right, so we went ahead and tried it. Now, first thing that, the easiest thing that we could do, just without knowing any theory, is, well, just try out this phenomenological model. All right, so separating the damping into these two parts, one that's related to the temperature dependence of conductivity, the other related to the temperature dependence of resistivity. All right, and just simply add them together with these two adjustable parameters, C and D. 
And to our surprise, this works, the simple model works surprisingly well. Uh, it actually captures essentially the essential, uh, essential temperature dependence of the total measured Gilbert damping. Uh, so this seems to be a good indication. Um, it's, it's quite promising in, the, in that it's, it appears to empirically uh, uh, confirm the idea that damping consists of both conductivity-like and resistivity-like contributions. Okay, uh, so I think I'm running a little long, so I'll just go through this quickly. Um, so this is an example where we compared our experimental results to a rather one of the older theoretical predictions from 2007, where we find surprisingly good quantitative agreement. And here's another one, um, another theoretical study use, um, using a, a somewhat more sophisticated computational, uh, computational machinery, where again, the agreement is quite good, uh, easily within a factor of two, well, I would say maybe about a factor of one and a half. Okay. Okay, so this is really one of the last things I will talk about. So this is another historical context going behind our experiment. So it turns out back in the 1970s, there were already some people who studied the temperature dependence of Gilbert damping. So back then they had a different name for it. It's a little hard to see. They call it Landau relaxation frequency. Uh, this is a quantity that's actually proportional to Gilbert damping. Okay. Um, okay. But, uh, so they do see clear signatures of conductivity like damping, uh, but turns out not actually for, uh, for some reason, not for iron. And this remained the case for the next, uh, let's say 30, 40 years. So it remained quite a bit of a mystery in the field such that, well, some theoretical uh, theorists began to wonder whether this conductivity like damping, this interband, or what they call interband scattering, uh, whether whether that's a, that's an even you know that that even exists, right. but <clears throat> but what our study, which was published in 2020, uh, uh, was able to achieve was that well, we have shown that there is also conductivity like intrinsic Gilbert damping in elemental iron as well. Now. Of course, the obvious question at this point is, well, why is it that we are able to see the signature, clear signature of conductivity like damping in iron, but not these people back in the 1970s? Well, at this point, we can only speculate. One possibility is that, well, conductivity like damping is rather sensitive to the quality, the cleanliness of the material. So one possibility is that these bulk crystals, so little millimeter scale flakes of iron, possibly were not quite as clean as our epitaxial films grown under a high vacuum condition. That's one possibility. Another possibility is something that's a little bit more technical. So this has to do with the complication of analyzing fMR results for large bulk samples. So millimeter scale samples, millimeter thick samples. Uh, so in such cases, you might have a microwave excitation that's not even uniform within the sample. And of course, you might have a huge amount of eddy current, uh, eddy current damping that's also not necessarily uniform in the sample. So it becomes very complicated to extract the true Gilbert damping parameter or Landau relaxation lifetime. So one possibility is that perhaps these people did also see conductivity like damping, but they might have overdone their analysis to the point that they might have effectively erased the signature of conductivity like damping, perhaps attributing that to some kind of other coexisting mechanisms. This is all speculative though, because uh, I don't, you know, we don't have a time machine to go back to the 1970s. So I'll just stop here with the speculation. And in fact, I will stop here with my talk so as a quick summary, what we have demonstrated is what we believe to be the first clear experimental evidence of intrinsic conductivity like Gilbert damping in pure iron or in an elemental ferromagnetic metal film. The most, I would say, the most striking finding about this is that you can have higher amount of dissipation or damping in the presence of less scattering, less disorder. So I hope you find that to be fundamentally interesting, interesting from the basic science point of view, uh, 
But we also argue that this is important for some of the emerging lower temperature applications. Let's say for quantum information applications, or even just interfacing magnetic devices with superconducting devices at low temperatures. So this tells us that if you want to minimize damping, if you want to reduce damping, reduce dissipation, it's actually better to not have an absolutely perfect magnetic material it's actually likely much better to have a material with some, some amount of disorder. All right, so I find that to be interesting, and we often find that kind of, we often run into this kind of message, some disorder imperfection is good, say in material science, but I would argue that this is also true for all of us, for us human beings, that it's probably better to be not absolutely perfect all the time it's really the disorder, the imperfections that make us more interesting, I think. So with that, uh, yeah, I will wrap up. Well, this is the end of my talk, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Thank you very much, Satoru, for, for the talk. Okay, questions? I know, it's, it's still, it, I, do, I do have to admit it's strange, yes. <laughs> so you said maybe just the finger would, would, would happen. So what does it mean? So that it like right, so conduct, oh right, okay, I can explain that again. So what I mean by conductivity like damping is when the film becomes more conductive, right, so the electrons are getting scattered less you end up with more dissipation in the mag magnetization dynamics. So, oh, so we're talking about just momentum scattering. So electron scattering, scattering off of phonons, scattering off of, uh, scattering off of disorder, right? So yeah, it, so when we say conductivity like, uh, so literally we mean scaling with the conductivity, the electrical conductivity of the material. And the scattering, yes, the scattering can come from, yeah, uh, interaction with thermal vibrations, phonons, or, or defects, which persist at lower temperatures. Questions? Satoru, yeah. uh, do you know uh, another, other materials uh, that the um, Dumping behaves mm -hmm. like iron. Right, um, so we haven't done this in thin film form, but again, uh, in cobalt and nickel, mm -hmm. even back in the 1970s, people, people already reported uh, rather large signatures of conductivity-like damping. So the damping is, in this case, it's increasing several fold, by a factor of several, as you approach lower temperatures. So when, they, when these films presume you become more and more conductive. Um, I will point out also another interesting thing. You see another alloy here. So this is a mixture of nickel with five atomic, five weight percent of copper. So here, the damping stays relatively constant. But what I imagine here is that here, the electrical conductivity or resistivity is likely you know, only weakly dependent, mostly constant with temperature as well. So this is, you know, just looking at this, this is already quite fascinating to me. So this already suggests a close relationship between electrical conductivity or resistivity with, uh, with, um, with damping inside, the magnetic damping and the magnetic metal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we think, ah. Oh. Yeah, so it could be any of those. Yeah, so on one hand, it could be defects in the lattice structure. It can be things like uh, dislocations, vacancies, grain boundaries. Could also be impurities, right? Uh, if we have other kinds of chemical elements in there. And for films that are thin enough, uh, yeah, I would imagine the surfaces would also play a big role, surface scattering. Uh, well, okay. I would say to first order, yes, but then I think if we think more about it, 
different kinds of disorder will contribute differently to scattering rates. So that's a very subtle question. Um, and I think if we, if we have the bandwidth to continue with this kind of project, that will be an interesting fundamental question. So how do different kinds of defects and disorder contribute differently to magnetic damping? But we don't have an answer to that. Oh, right, yeah, so then, you know, you no longer have, well, you can't really, you can't really resort to a fairy surface, of course, <laughs> but uh, with that said, okay, so this does remind me, uh, at least, I don't know about isolated spins in the nuclear setting, but there is actually sort of a, a transport equivalent to conductivity like damping and resistivity like damping. So for those of you folks familiar with spin transport, on one hand you have what's called a elliott yaffet spin scattering. So this is a picture where whenever uh, an electron carrying a spin undergoes momentum scattering, uh, there's a probability that the spin will also get flipped. That seems to make sense, I think, intuitively. But there's actually another type of spin relaxation, or in spin transport, called diakonov peril DP, DP relaxation. So there, the picture is that the transported spin is continually dephasing as it's moving, but every time it scatters, the phase, get re phase actually gets reset. You, uh, you stop the dephasing. So in that sense, that's a little bit like the conductivity-like mechanism. Oh, uh, okay, so there's an equivalent in NMR as well. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we thank Satura again. And... Thank you.